Good afternoon and welcome back. Uh, my name is Donna McKelvey. I am the Vice President of Alliance Development and Membership, and we are delighted to have you uh, back with us this afternoon. While we wait for our audience to join us, um, I wanted to just share a few uh, small housekeeping notes just to make sure everybody is finding their way around our site. Um, I want to remind you that you can read all of the speaker bios um, by clicking on the speaker name on the program. So please do check out all of those. You can also follow along with us on Twitter by using the hashtag RA forum. And then also you can chat with each other um, and also our panelists. So please use the chat feature. And then also you can ask questions of our panelists by using the Q&A uh, feature. And I don't, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you to please go visit the vault, the video vault for our 20 voices, three minutes, one question segment. So um, we are ready to get started. I just wanted to share those few housekeeping notes with you. So again, welcome to our audience. This next panel discussion focuses on an issue that has immediate and long-term significance. The discussion entitled Vaccine Development, Are We at a Turning Point? And it's being moderated by Esther Crofer, the Executive Director of Faster Cures. And our panelists today include Dr. Ruth Karen, professor in the Department of International Health and Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's also the director of the Center for Immunization Research and the founding director of Johns Hopkins Vaccine Initiative. Also joining us is Dr. Mike Levine, professor and associate dean at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and the founder of the Center for Vaccine Development. Also joining Dr. Mark McClellan, the director of the Robert J. Margolis MD Center for Health Policy at Duke University and also a Research America board member. Dr. Gary Nabel, chief scientific officer and senior vice president for global research and development at Santa Fe. Dr. Paul Offit, the director of the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And Will Zerhouni, Managing Director of TRGP Investment Partners. Now remember, you can ask our panelists questions using the Q&A feature, and I'm excited to get things started, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Esther. Well, thank you so much, Donna, and welcome, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we have a terrific panel today, which you have heard about, with leading experts to discuss the various challenges related to vaccine development and the implications of the race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine or multiple vaccines. As of this morning, when I checked, there are over 27 million global confirmed cases of COVID-19 and 892,000 deaths. In the US, we have 6.3 million confirmed cases and we're approaching 190,000 deaths. We have seen significant economic disruption to businesses and families and normal day-to-day -day activities have been vastly altered. Leading experts have said we need a vaccine to return to normal, which is why the topic of today's discussion is so critical. We will also discuss the lessons that we're learning now in developing a COVID-19 vaccine and the implications for future vaccine development. So we have a short amount of time and a number of really terrific speakers. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Mark, uh, why don't we begin with you? We've all heard about vaccines under development from Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca in partnership with the University of Oxford, all of which that are currently in phase three clinical trials. You've been working on many fronts, helping to establish a viable process to fast track safe and effective vaccines. Can you fill us in on what that process looks like and where do things stand now? Mark? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. And first off, uh, th thanks for 
bringing us together. This is a great group, very timely topic. And there's a, a reminder of why Research America's mission is important. Uh, this is it. Um, it really has been impressive to see the amount of research and development progress happening on COVID-19, particularly in the area of vaccines. Um, as as I sort of mentioned, we've been working on this topic for a while. If you go to the Duke Margolis website and look for uh, uh, accelerating therapeutics or a topic like that, um, and a lot of the information that we put together on, on what's happened this time that is so different because of the very large health and economic consequences of this pandemic. And essentially, we're moving a lot faster and with multiple vaccines at the same time, you know, seven that are backed jointly by the federal government, more in development in China and, and Europe and other parts of the world because of the uh, high burden of the pandemic, not because we're necessarily cutting corners. What's really changed is moving from a, a long and linear and uncertain and, and questionably funded process to one that is hyper parallel with clarity in every channel that needs to succeed to get to a safe and effective vaccine. So that includes clear guidance on what needs to be done uh, from a regulatory standpoint, FDA and other regulatory agencies came together early on around some specific guidance on what was expected for a vaccine and preclinical testing and getting into humans. FDA issued a very detailed guidance that uh, would recommend people who are interested in this topic take a look at back in June for the clinical development process. So some clarity about what's needed to be demonstrated in terms of an impact on reducing the severity of infections, reducing the number of infections by at least 50% for a vaccine would be having a clinical trial of substantial size in order to do that in a reasonably potential safety uh, effects in a bigger population too. Um, at the same time, the NIH and other groups have come together to develop a clinical trial network that is enrolling large numbers of people in these trials. So for the, uh, the early trials to get started at large scale for Moderna, for Pfizer, uh, coming soon, uh, AstraZeneca uh, has already started to enroll and several more in the next month. Uh, expecting 30,000 or more enrollees. And many of these trials that just started enrolling recently are already up to that number. Pfizer is already in the second round of vaccination for this uh, two dose uh, vaccine that, that they are, the first vaccine that they're developing. So the clinical trials are happening at an unprecedented pace. And at the same time, there's a lot of early investment in manufacturing a vaccine at scale before we even know if it works. So uh, BARDA, the, the government agency that oversees these uh, um, uh, countermeasure and, and public health uh, emergency activities is going in jointly with many of the manufacturers to build manufacturing capacity here and elsewhere to have literally uh, tens if not hundreds of millions of doses of each of these promising vaccines available by the time the clinical trials are completed. And there's been a lot of discussion recently about whether this speed means corners are being cut. And I would say based on what I've seen so far, uh, the answer really is no. It's really just a, a very uh, substantial planning process to get all of these critical steps done at the same time. Looking ahead, there's some very important decisions coming based on the evidence that's being developed in the clinical trials. The FDA has made clear in its guidance that a vaccine is not going to be approved even for emergency use unless there is a clear clinical signal that meets that standard of effectiveness and also no clear data in these tens of thousands of patients who will have been tested uh, of an, a clear uh, safety problem. Not only that, the drug safety data collection is going to continue out for a couple of years uh, as FDA often does with uh, vaccines to make sure there aren't any late issues. So uh, how fast this could be done has been the subject of a lot of debate uh, among scientists, political, uh, political uh, um, uh, other, and others. And it seems unlikely that we're going to have any of these trials completed to the point where that level of evidence is available before the election. 
but people should have a clear understanding that FDA and the other groups involved in these efforts intends to have a very transparent process going forward. So before FDA approves a vaccine, it's made clear that it's going to have a meeting of its independent advisory committee. For that advisory committee meeting, there will be data reported from the company that they put in their application for emergency use or otherwise. There will be a review from the FDA staff about what they think of the data, and there will be public discussion about what it all means as a basis for any further decision. I just also emphasize that emergency use for a vaccine would be very different than emergency use for a treatment like say convalescent plasma. That's a, the treatment where we've seen it used in many, many other conditions and in uh, literally thousands of patients with uh, uh, serious COVID infections. It's intended for people who are hospitalized or seriously ill, not for a, a broad healthy population. Uh, and uh, because there are not very many safety concerns, it's a different kind of standard than what I just was talking about for vaccines. So some very important developments over the coming weeks. We'll see how fast the trials can actually go in terms of not just enrolling patients, but with a declining rate of COVID in many parts of the country. It's a good thing for, for public health, but it means it may take longer for trials to complete. We'll see how effective the vaccines really are in reducing the number and severity of COVID infections. And will the people who are running the trials, their data safety monitoring boards will be looking along the way to see when uh, there is an actual signal that meets those FDA standards. So I think as long as we're following uh, the very clearly laid out FDA standards and the uh, very um, uh, clearly defined approach that the FDA's experts and their biologic center have laid out uh, to get us to this point and to help us move forward, uh, we do have a very promising outlook for vaccines. That said, I think we are still weeks to months away from having that more definitive evidence. And, and even then, Esther, as we may talk about during the, the panel, it's gonna be some time before the vaccine gets out to everyone. You know, maybe starting with some very high risk uh, or high uh, priority groups uh, like uh, military personnel and, and medical responders and going out from that as the evidence accumulates and, and we have more supplies of vaccines available. So we are at a critical time now, uh, but I think we're going to be in this uh, phase of uncertainty and continuing to learn uh, for a number of weeks to come. Well, Mark, that was a terrific overview and we'll pick up on a lot of the themes that you just talked about. Um, Paul, I actually want to get you into this conversation on the topic of the timeline. Um, since the early part of the year, we've heard 12 to 18 months, and we're approaching, you know, some part of that and the expectation that we'll have some kind of a vaccine or vaccine candidates available as early as even November or December. Can you help us understand what this timeline means for traditional vaccine development? What can we expect toward the end of this year? And then what can we expect in Q1 or mid middle of next year? And is all of this realistic? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to make any prediction you like, as long as you don't hold me to it six months. <laughs> um, what I would say is, is, and Mark covered a lot of this, um, I mean, the average length of time it takes to make, make a vaccine is usually about 15, 20 years. Uh, um, certainly Gary and Mike and Ruth know all this. The, the, um, because we do it sequentially. As Mark said, I mean, you go from preclinical trials to phase one to phase two to phase three, so small, small dose ranging trials, to sort of larger sort of dosing trials and safety trials, and then you then you get the big definitive phase three trial, the big you know the prospect of placebo control, thirty thousand person trial, which is the only way you're going to determine efficacy and at least safety in tens of thousands of people. Um, what what has happened now is the government basically has taken the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies. They they we've uh, been able to coalesce timelines. Um, because the government has said, look, we'll, we'll take the risk. We'll, take, we'll pay for the phase three trial, at least in some cases. We'll mass produce this vaccine at risk without knowing whether it's safe or effective. We're willing to throw away doses. If it's if tens of millions of doses, if it's shown not to be safe and effective, obviously no company would ever do that. And that's why it's so much faster. I think that, that on the one hand, I'm not worried about the, this coalescence of timelines for, for this reason. Um, we're doing big phase three trials. I mean, if we do what we're, we're saying we're going to do, which is a 30,000 person trial, say 20,000 vaccine, 10,000 placebo, that's great. I mean, the HPV vaccine trial was a 30,000 person trial. The conjugate pneumococcal vaccine was around a 35,000 person trial. So that's fine. 
That doesn't worry me. There's also two other things that are standing in the way of releasing a vaccine that would be less than safe or less than effective. And that's the Data Safety Monitoring Board who are charged with, with looking over these vaccines as they would for any vaccine. That's good. And then if, if Dr. Hahn is, is, uh, is true to his word, when he wrote that op-ed in the Washington uh, Post or in the, uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, that he's going to then seek the advice of the FDA's uh, VRPAC committee, the Vaccine Advisory Committee, that's another group of, of independent uh, researchers who are not associated with the government, not associated with the pharmaceutical industry, I think he will give you their honest opinion. None of that worries me. I think that's all good. Uh, the, the one, however, has to be a little concerned about a few things. One is that um, this isn't a standard licensure procedure. It's not. It's li likely to go through emergency use authorization, and that's a little looser. I mean, the, you know, the language that surrounds emergency use authorization according to the FDA guidelines, you know, includes phrases like may be effective. So you, you do worry about that sort of thing. The second thing you worry about is that if you look at what happened with hydroxychloroquine or with convalescent plasma, and although Mark is right that those were, those were given to people who, uh, for treatment of people who are already sick, um, this vaccines are different in that they're being given to, uh, you know, to millions of people who are generally going to be healthy young people who are not likely to die from this infection. So you certainly want to hold them to a high standard of safety and efficacy. And I do worry in those first two cases that you clearly saw influence, I think, by the administration on the FDA, at least the, the, the senior leadership of the FDA, to, um, to do something that shouldn't have been done. I think actually neither of those should have been uh, uh, approved for use. So people then are worried about whether the vaccines would be approved for use under a much looser standard. I mean, so much so actually that the, then Gary can address this too. I mean, the pharma you saw in the last day or two, the pharmaceutical industry sort of got together, the major players, and wrote a letter saying, don't worry, you know, this, these vaccines are going to be held to a high standard of safety and efficacy. They shouldn't have to write that letter. I mean, that's what the FDA does. The FDA stands between the American public and the, the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry to make sure you get uh, products that are safe and effective. So it just worries me that they felt the need to do that. And I think what they're doing when they, they write that letter is that they say, sense actually in this country that there is, there is a question about the FDA's uh, willingness to stand up to an administration that's going to be under pressure. I mean, the pressures are gonna come not just from the November 3rd election, but from the fact that China, Russia, the United Kingdom may well come out with vaccines before we do. And there may be a pressure with that too. So that's all. I mean, I think as it stands between the DSMD, the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee, I think, and, and um, the, the, you know, Dr. Hans and these commitments uh, on paper to make sure that, you know, that we hold these to a standard, I feel good. But, you know, you are a little worried. That's it. So it's, uh, maybe I'm a worrier. Maybe nobody else on this call is a worrier, but it does worry me a little bit. So I'll stop there and thank you. Yeah, so just to follow up on a couple points there, and I'll bring others into the conversation as well. So is it then guaranteed that we're going to have a COVID-19 vaccine? Because as many scientists have said, science is hard, and you've obviously been involved in science for many decades. Um, are we guaranteed to have a vaccine that is safe and high, has high efficacy? So you, you'd like to, well, no, there's no guarantees. I mean, you know, what, what we, we have this elusive, difficult to characterize virus, this bat coronavirus that just made its debut in the human population that's already done things you would have never predicted. I mean, it's, it, it rages in the summer months. This envelope virus spread by small droplets rages in the summer months. Who would have ever predicted that? I'm on service now. We ran on a patient who has, you know, MIIC infection, you know, which is a post-infectious phenomenon. I don't know of any virus that does what happened to this child. Um, you know, it has a predilection for nursing homes. I mean, you know, influenza also kills older people, but fewer than 10% of those deaths are in nursing homes. Here, it's more than 40%. Um, and it causes a vasculitis, and not because it appears to uh, replicate or reproduce itself in endothelial cells that line blood vessels. It appears to be all immunologically mediated. Therefore, all organs are at risk, you know, heart attacks, strokes, liver disease, kidney disease. That's surprising. And, and we're meeting that challenge with vaccine strategies like mRNA, DNA, replication effect of human adenoviruses, replication effect of simian adenoviruses, that have basically never been used as commercial products in the United States before. So, I mean, is there going to be a learning curve over the next few years? I can't imagine there wouldn't be. The things that we wish we knew now that we're about to learn over the next two years. So I guess the short answer is no, there's no guarantee for success. That's why you do the phase three trials. Yeah. And you know, we'll come back to that discussion about the level of evidence that's needed for emergency use authorization versus licensure. But Mike, I wanted to pick up um, with the point that Paul brought up, which is 
there's a lot of different kinds of technology right now that's in development that has never gone all the way through to commercialization. Um, so first, you know, what has happened in the past that's brought us to this point that we can even accelerate the development of the COVID-19 vaccine with these new technologies? And how do you think about that going forward? I mean, are we now testing things that you anticipate will have treasures of vaccine for other conditions as we go forward in the future? What led us to this point? That, that's a great uh, question and very broad reaching. So let me first, as context, uh, state very clearly that uh, we look upon vaccines in somewhat two different uh, baskets. Uh, one are the vaccines that will be used routinely, in particular for infants. Uh, safety is, is very, very much uh, uh, our area of, of, of concern. Um, and our typical infant vaccines are examples. Uh, the COVID vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine, is what we call a FAIC, or a public health emergency of international concern vaccine. And it's a different ballgame. It's a different handbook that we follow. We have thought about and worried about a, uh, a pandemic like we're seeing now, because once before, a century ago, we saw it with an influenza vaccine. And so we know it can happen. There have been a few signals that stimulated dress rehearsals. One was way back in 1976, when I was a young assistant professor, and there was a worry about a swine flu uh, a pandemic. The, the uh, modern dress rehearsals, in my view, begin seriously uh, with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which devastated the healthcare infrastructure, um, destroyed the economies, and when cases started to appear in Europe and North America, uh, it became very clear uh, all the consequences and we began to worry more. Out of that 2014-2015 uh, uh, epidemic came the uh, birth of the of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. This is CEPI's moment. This is why CEPI was created. Um, for science to make vaccines to quickly, quickly uh, 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 rev up, we've seen uh, a number of milestones put to use. And technologies, uh, we call them platforms, where one can take the sequence of a virus, pick out the antigen of, of putative uh, a key uh, interest, and use that sequence to either express in live virus vectors or uh, to make uh, purified proteins or to make nucleic acid vaccines all become possibilities. Each one of those is a potential shot on goal. There's been a lot of background work on these platforms. And um, uh, part of what CEPI and other groups have been doing is monitoring and looking at what might be the next dangerous organism. The SARS uh, outbreaks in 2002 to 2004, that was a harbinger of what might happen. The MERS is a harbinger. Those are both other uh, beta coronaviruses. And here along uh, comes this, this uh, beast of a virus uh, beginning in, in East Asia. Very quickly, the sequence of that virus was made public. Very quickly, that was utilized by various vaccine developers. On the way, one, uh, one of the things that was done was a modification of the sequence so that this is work done at the Vaccine Research Center of NIH, modification so that the pre-fusion configuration becomes stabilized, which theoretically enhances the stimulation of neutralizing antibodies. So this is mRNA's uh, moment and viral live vectors moment because they are ways to quickly make vaccines the mRNA has the theoretical advantage of going, and it's been shown, from sequence to first inoculation in just about two months. 
and um, also the possibility of large scale manufacture. But these are not from the pandemic uh, perspective, super perfect vaccines, if, even if they are safe and they are highly protective, uh, they require two doses, uh, they require a special cold chain. This, these are not showstoppers, these are solvable, but we're so far along, we're, uh, we're very, very close potentially to having very good vaccines. Last point I would make is this is truly a global problem. We have to have vaccine not only for US and Europe, but we have to have vaccine for the entire world because as long as there is a reservoir of continuing transmission, uh, the homeland, the US homeland, uh, the rest of the industrialized countries are at risk. Yeah. You know, um, Ruth, I want to bring you into this as well. And, and Mike um, just did a nice job laying out the potential for these different technologies, how quickly you can develop a vaccine. We have the mRNA platform, as he described. Um, but for what that means is that we need a robust process for evidence generation and conducting clinical trials in such a way that we can determine which vaccine is the most effective for different populations that may benefit. And I know you do a lot of work thinking about these kinds of issues. So when we're looking at enrolling different patients into trials, uh, pregnant women, children, for example, the elderly, um, right now for COVID-19, uh, disaffected, um, highly impacted patient populations like minority communities, how important is it that these trials are representative if we can get the definitive answers that we need, um, either for authorization or licensure, and we'll certainly like to get everybody's thoughts on that as well. Ruth, then you're on mute before you start to speak. Yes, thanks, thanks so much for that reminder, Esther. Um, so I think you bring up a really um, very important point, and I think that um, all of these considerations are not the same, and I think we should start there and to say, that um, pregnant women, children, um, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, and of course there are overlaps in those categories, but those are not all the same and I, I don't think we should sort of treat it, we should lump those together as we, as we think about clinical development. Um, you know, I, I, in thinking about this panel, I've been thinking a lot about lessons learned for the future and how we can and how we can think about um, what what we do in this time will inform our future vaccine development and when i think of the really critical issues is going to be around inclusion and one of the legacies of this is going to be around inclusion because certainly um, this is not a new problem right either the problem speaking particularly about racial and ethnic minorities having a disproportionate burden of both infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases is certainly not a new problem and lack of inclusion in clinical trials is not a new problem but our focus on this and our our efforts to make this right both because we need these data to, these are critical data for us to think about how we deploy vaccines because we will have, we do have a number of vaccines. I, I think by nature am an optimist and I think that, I actually think we will have vaccines and I think we will have more than one vaccine myself. Um, but to think about how to best use these vaccines um, we really need to know how they work in populations and we really need to be able to build trust um, as we're doing the trials, which is a bridge to having trust when we deploy vaccines. Um, I would say that for all of the populations that we consider, we want to think about risk, benefit, different platforms, um, what we're trying to prevent um, in terms of vaccination, are we trying to prevent acute disease? Are we trying to prevent severe disease? Are we trying, in fact, to prevent transmission, which I would remind everybody we're not looking at in any of our U.S. trials for certain. So, so that's, a, that's a bit of a jump in our, in our thinking, although certainly we do have many examples of 
um, of pediatric vaccines, for example, that have prevented um, transmission to others. Um, so I think those are all issues that we'll, that we'll, that we'll need to think about as we um, continue with the evaluation of these vaccines. And I would also just say that um, we all, as, as clinical investigators, as policymakers, as developers, we really have to walk the talk. Um, I think that everybody has, everyone has embraced the notion that we have to have diversity in trials, but we actually have to continually monitor and think about if we're not hitting our targets, if we're not doing what we want to do, what, it, what are the barriers and how do we overcome those? You know, Ruth, from what you've seen so far, just to follow up on what you've said, are you comfortable with the level of enrollment that you have seen around diverse population? What do you think still needs to be done? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think there are the, the, um, the practical issues and I think there are the, um, the, 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 the trust issues, to be honest. I think around the practical issues, we have to remove barriers. So we need, you know, one of the things that I think all of my colleagues have highlighted is that this is not, one, this is not business as usual. Two, we have resources for vaccine development, the likes of which none of us have ever seen, right? And, and we need to use those resources for good. So, if um, there are barriers to enrollment that are around access, right? Somebody doesn't have a car or transportation to get to a vaccine center, by all means, there should be mobile vans that can go um, to where the people are. If there are populations that are small and rural and, and you know, have different ways of doing things. We, uh, one of the things that I think is really important is that we need to listen both to the populations and actually to some of the really experienced clinical investigators who have spent their careers in some cases working with disadvantaged populations about to ask them what both the populations themselves and the investigators what do these populations need? So that's a very sort of pragmatic answer. Then on the other side, there is building trust. And that has to do with both, um, quite frankly, having members of a study team who are members of racial and ethnic minorities so that people can feel comfortable that there are, there are people on that team that look like them that are part of their communities. And it also has to do with going to community leaders um, to engage and to support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think building that trust in an ongoing way is mm -hmm. going to be extremely important with local communities. Um, Will, if I can turn to you, as we heard when Mark described the landscape, uh, for many of the programs that are well underway, the government has borne the full risk, right? That's why we're able to accelerate things so quickly. And we know that it takes a tremendous amount of resources to bring any vaccine uh, to, to the population, right? Uh, all the way through to commercialization. Um, we talk about how it takes a billion dollars, 10 to 15 years to develop any one drug. When we're in a pandemic, um, we rally around because of the significant disruption. And then it's solved and then we move on to other issues. And you recently co-authored a paper in Science Magazine, along with Gary and, uh, and others, just around this topic of how do we need to provide the right incentives, not just when we're in the middle of a pandemic, but post-pandemic, so that when we are confronted with yet another pathogen, we're better prepared. Um, do you see those kinds of incentives that you wrote about happening now? What do you think about them going forward? Well, thank you, Esther, and good afternoon, and thank you, um, everybody else, for being involved. It's an honor to be here and to be with you. Um, you know, Dr. Nabel and the others that you mentioned were actually my father, Dr. Zerhouni, um, and I had authored this paper together to think a little bit about the innovation regime that we have in this country and how it's applied to the current efforts to develop and then disseminate a vaccine, and then the opportunities that it provides for future crises. You know, in this country, 
our innovation regime comes out of the Constitution. Section 8, Clause 8 provides for patents and for copyrights. And that covers one part of what we need to develop vaccines in this or any other crisis, the innovation incentive. You need to create an incentive for people to uh, develop and, to, and transmit and manufacture all of these uh, different vaccines and therapeutics. But the other part of the problem is that patents essentially create that incentive by giving a 20 year monopoly to the owner of the patent. And so while you have conceived of your invention, reduced it to practice, and then given public disclosure, which is the trade-off for that 20 year monopoly, we really get to an issue that Dr. Karen just raised, inclusion, but inclusion in pricing. Because once you have received the innovation and exchanged it for a monopoly, there really is no inclusion because you're going to get monopoly prices. And the problem in a crisis like this one, where anybody can get infected, where there are huge positive externalities to or towards vaccinating anybody, whether they can afford to pay or not, we're really at a disadvantage if we rely entirely on the patent system. So Dr. Nabel, Dr. Zahuni, and I um, had talked about what alternatives could we use. And in fact, these alternatives should not be unfamiliar to people in pharma because it's an alternative that pharma uses privately every day. It's essentially a reward system. So where you want to create an incentive to develop, to innovate, and then to disseminate, um, on the other hand, you want to create pricing that is as close to marginal cost as possible. So if governments acting individually or ideally collaboratively across the G8 or the G20 could create pools of rewards for phase one completion, phase two completion, phase three completion and approval, and then for manufacturing and distribution and uh, administration, what we could have is the best of both worlds. We could have the incentive to innovate as well with pricing as close to marginal cost as possible. And in infectious disease, where you have huge positive externalities whenever you treat your marginal additional patient, that's a pricing mechanism that is superior to the patent pricing mechanism we have now. I wanna cite something Dr. Levine said earlier. He said that you know, we could have these reservoirs of continuing transmission. And the problem that we have internationally is that we are right now in the United States, that reservoir of continuing transmission. And I think if you look at it, we need to cooperate and collaborate, collaborate internationally so that we can create such a regime of incentives and then apply it internationally. So you could do it with the wealthiest countries creating a reward pot for all of the innovators. It could be G8, G20. And then we need to have international distribution. So what are you, to your question, Esther, you say, what are we doing now? I mean, I think there are certain things that we're doing now that are the wrong way to go. For example, trying to pick ex ante winners and losers through government grants to specific uh, manufacturers, I don't think is the right way to go. Um, it used to be a time when people with an R next to their name used to believe that you didn't pick winners and losers either in economics and the market or in science. I still don't think we should be picking winners and losers. But I think the strategy that we have proposed doesn't do that. I think what we do is we let the cream rise to the top, incentivized by a reward system, and then we price as close to marginal costs as possible so that everybody can benefit on an inclusive basis from the innovations that the public has funded. Well, I think you raise uh, an important point in terms of what do we need in a sustainable way, right, to continue innovation well past the peak of, of the pandemic. Um, what we have seen, and I'll turn to Gary, is that um, we've seen tremendous collaboration, right? We've seen companies come together in new and different ways. Um, potentially that will continue going forward in the future. We have seen philanthropy and the private sector come to bear on clinical development in ways that we perhaps have not seen before or certainly not at this scale. So when you think about the ideal system, and, and Will pointed out one part of what an ideal system could look like, when we go forward, what do you think is the ideal role of industry, private sector, philanthropy, government, in really having a cohesive vaccine development ecosystem? Well, uh, thanks, Esther. That's a really important question and one that, you know, I've been involved with uh, since my very early days at the NIH uh, with Tony, actually, uh, developing the Vaccine Research Center. You know, I think that Will's comment really, uh, and, and the piece we wrote together with Elias, 
uh, highlight the fact that we um, essentially, when we approach these outbreaks, we basically have a fire drill when there's an emergency. And so we have these boom and bust cycles where we invest in vaccines and vaccine research. I think as all of us appreciate that it, it, for us to build you know, sustainable and effective deterrence for infectious disease, and I would argue for all of human health, we need to have consistent and sustainable funding. And, uh, you know, in some ways, I think, uh, you know, Mike in his comment uh, mentioned the importance of structural biology uh, in the current vaccines that are going forward. Uh, when you look at the complexity of, of vaccine development, what it takes, um, I, I can't stress enough how unimaginably complex this process is. I would argue that of all the endeavors that we undertake as human beings, um, you know, from building cars to getting to the moon to whatever, uh, developing new medicines, there's probably nothing more complex than developing a vaccine. It starts, you know, with the things as sophisticated as structural biology that we just, that, that Mike mentioned. It goes to virology, immunology, it goes to human uh, health, it goes to uh, manufacturing technology, it goes to ethics, it goes to the way societies live and accept information, uh, it, and then it goes to the diversity of the human population. You know, think about when, when um, uh, we were talking about vaccine trials, uh, think about going out in the real world. We're, we're, we're doing trials and we're not doing trials where the control group is identically and genetically matched and kept in the same environment as the control group. We're dealing with populations where people are walking around, some have underlying cancer, some have cold, some have diarrhea, some, and you're doing a trial in the real world where all of these people are exposed to the vagaries of normal life. That's why we do the 30,000 person trial that, um, that, that we talked about earlier. So from my perspective, the, the most important thing we can do, and I think what we really need to begin to implement in a serious way, is uh, a, a really a global uh, public-private partnership where we, for, where we find mechanisms by which we can continually support these efforts, where we systematically monitor new bio threats, where we systematically develop better diagnostics so that we can catch them early, where we have preventive measures that are in place that uh, guard against the most likely threats in the shortest period of time, and where we can then, you know, uh, deploy our knowledge about vaccines in a way that leads us to the kind of fruitful and protective um, countermeasures that we need. The only other comment I would make is, you know, I, and several have said this, and Tony said it in his comments earlier, that it's, it, it is completely um, unprecedented that we've been able to develop a vaccine in the period of time that we have. And every, a lot of people should be congratulated for this. It, it's, an, again, both from the industry and from basic science, from the NIH uh, to the CDC uh, to the FDA. Um, but I think that uh, we should also forget that one of the reasons, should not forget that one of the reasons we're able to act this quickly is that our effort on these coronavirus vaccines actually did start with the first SARS in 2004. And it, and it started us on this road of developing effective vaccines for coronaviruses, first with the, the very first SARS vaccine. And we actually developed a prototype that couldn't be tested in 2004 at the, at the Vaccine Research Center. But it then progressed with MERS and that point mutation that Mike was talking about came out of MERS research. And that MERS research was then applied to the second SARS virus. So it shows you the value of consistent long-term support from the re research enterprise and across the board in technology and clinical development and, um, and 
uh, public health. So that's, I think, what we need to focus on for the long term. You know, I think to that point, we have the potential to bear the fruit of the labor today uh, for the future, um, many decades, decades from now, just as you pointed out that what we're experiencing today in acceleration actually started with SARS. But I think, again, as Will said earlier, we need that sustained kind of funding. Um, you know, there, there are pressures, uh, of course, right now that, you know, we're, we've been talking about, we've been hearing about. And I wanted to go back to that um, around evidence generation and to go back to the conversation we started with, with Mark and, and, and Paul commenting around what do we need from an evidence perspective that will make the public feel confident within a vaccine if it's been authorized under an emergency use authorization? What is that bar? And then what's that second bar in terms of licensure? Mark, should we be concerned as Paul talked about, or are you feeling confident? Well, I feel more confident if there are lots of people with the knowledge and respect that Paul has making clear uh, that we need to take this vaccine um, uh, emergency use or broader use really seriously. Um, I think the good foundation we have to build on this is that FDA and its staff, the Biologic Center, have been pretty clear uh, about what's needed to get their recommendation for approval, either for emergency use or more broadly, for a vaccine. For those of you who are interested, we have a, a kind of a follow-up event on this topic on Thursday with the, the leadership of the, the Center for Biologics, where they're going to talk a lot uh, about this exact uh, topic. And if you look at what they've said, it, it is going to be very different than the emergency use authorization standard for something like um, uh, remdesivir or convalescent plasma. And this is a reminder, that is a standard that in general does not require definitive evidence of safety and effectiveness. And that's why some of the treatments that have been approved so far where there is not um, any evidence of a substantial safety problem, and there could be evidence of benefit, uh, is uh, why that's been done for, for these treatments in seriously ill patients. I personally would feel much better if we had a better evidence development system in place for those technologies, just like we do for vaccines because of you know, all this parallel effort that's gone into support vaccine development. In contrast, we still don't have a good randomized trial completed of convalescent plasma, and we'd still like to learn more about some of the other treatments that have been approved for emergency use and that are in development. And, you know, frankly, things are, are not going as, as quickly as we could then. And I'd like to take a lesson out of the playbook for vaccines to set up some uh, simpler, more compelling uh, clinical trial networks for the other therapeutics. Uh, but back to, back to vaccines in particular, um, I think what would be very helpful is for uh, people like those in this group to make sure they understand um, what exactly the biologic center at FDA is looking for when it comes to a decision or recommendation about emergency use authorization or broader authorization for a vaccine. I think the more that um, thoughtful people can take a look at those standards, which they're trying to be very clear about and help make the American public more aware, uh, hopefully we can address some of the challenges that just start coming with this, you know, very political pre-election environment that we're living in. And I think this is not just an issue between now and November 3rd, but remember after the election, there will be a, some period of time potentially when we aren't sure about the results or maybe a transition. Uh, there will be actually the, the next few months are gonna be the very important months I think for vaccines, where we will have more of this evidence coming along, where we will potentially be actually getting into distribution and hopefully getting into distribution that will reach uh, at-risk populations like the communities of color and others that, uh, uh, that Ruth has mentioned. And for that to work, it's not just a matter of working out the technical details of distribution, it's a matter of working out the reasonable basis for public confidence in the decisions that are made. And I think all of us here uh, who care about these issues and who are viewed as um, having some relevant expertise to the issues uh, owe it to the American public to spend some real time looking closely at what would be involved in emergency use authorization, what would be involved in approval, and, and making sure we're comfortable with that and we can talk to the American public about it. Uh, we've had every other piece of this 
vaccine development effort proceed at a uh, accelerated pace with intense effort in a hyper parallel way. This other key element, uh, public understanding, expert understanding, and, and uh, uh, communication is another key part of that parallel process to actually work. We need to bring the American public along. And the only way to do that is to have a process that works. So that's why steps like what industry has done recently to say they're, they want to be behind an effective FDA regulatory process, why uh, what you know, people like me and other former commissioners have said along the same lines, uh, we, we need more people who are willing to take a close look and, and try to get behind a, uh, an effective approach here uh, for public confidence um, in the vaccines that, that will be coming and the decisions and the support effective decision making about them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want to bring Ruth into this as well, who has a comment on, on this question. Um, and then, you know, Paul, just to, to begin to tee up for you a question around safety data and monitoring. What does that mean going forward in terms of the public trust? But Ruth, did you have a comment around this evidence generation question? And you're on mute again. Sorry about that. Yeah, I actually just wanted to make a comment about um, public trust and communication. And this will, Paul may have two things to address when he's teed up next, because I'm sure this will play very much into, into things he's interested in. Um, I think that regardless of the um, extent of the evidence that we have, whether for EUA or for licensure, there will be things that we don't yet know. For example, an obvious example of this is we will not know much of, if anything, about the durability of protection. Um, and there may be other things we don't know. We will not know, even with these 30,000 person trials, there may be rare side effects that we don't detect in these initial efficacy trials. All of these things are true when we're licensing vaccines in other contexts, but it will be true here also. I actually think that this is sort of a, a national teachable moment about vaccines. And I absolutely, I, I saw in the chat box somebody mentioning the New York Times vaccine tracker. Um, I would inc really encourage um, anyone listening who has not gone to that website and not looked at that vaccine tracker to look at it because it's an extraordinary um, piece of education for the general public about the kinds of vaccines that we're evaluating. But I think it's also really important when we do efficacy trials for the public to begin to understand you, it explained in ways that everyone can understand, quite frankly, what are some of the statistical tests that we do? When the FDA says a lower bound on a confidence interval of 30%, what does that actually mean? And what does a point estimate mean? And if we say something, you know, one vaccine is 70% effective and one is 65% effective against its endpoints and the confidence intervals overlap, are those vaccines different? I think we really need to think more about how we can educate the public and thinking forward, thinking about the legacy of this after this pandemic is over. If we can use this time to teach the, the public more about vaccines, we will, we will be better off for this problem and for future problems. You know, public education is absolutely going to be critical. And what the public understands is length of time. They understand vaccine was in development for a period of time and is now made available. You know, and Paul, how can you help explain to the public that question around the timeline for development and any concerns about safety or adverse events that typically don't emerge until you get to hundreds of thousands of people who have gotten vaccinated? Right, I mean, it, it's, you know, when vaccines are launched, they're not launched because you know everything they're launched because you know enough, because you have enough safety data, enough efficacy data to say that, um, that the benefits of this vaccine, as we understand it, clearly um, outweigh its theoretical risks. And certainly the benefits here are great. We have a thousand people dying a day of this virus. I do think there, there's, a, there's gonna be a, a hill to climb. And I, I think, there, there, and it's understandable, there, you have a skittish American public. The reason that they're skittish are, are several fold. One is that, that the language that has surrounded this process has been scary. You know, warp speed, phrases like, 
like warp speed, race to a vaccine, who's the finalist? I mean, one gets the feeling that things are being um, truncated uh, unnecessarily or worse, that safety guidelines are being skipped. You do have a, uh, an administration that has been willing to perturb the science, whether it's the Environmental Protection Agency and, and other sort of science-based agencies, the National Weather Service now, the, the Food and Drug Administration makes people nervous, makes me nervous. I mean, so I can understand how they'd be nervous. Um, and then also just personally, it's like when you see, for example, phase one trials being published in the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet, which involve 10 people or 15 people that are actually getting you know, the dose and, and uh, that, that's going to be the final dose. And then you hear the companies talking about how they can make tens of millions of doses, it's a little nerve wracking. What, what, you, what you, you don't feel at some level is, 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 is the humility that should be all part of this process. I mean, Gary, Ruth, Mike, and I know this well. I mean, you, as you move forward in, in these processes, I mean, the, nature gives its secrets up slowly, grudgingly, and often with a human price. I mean, I worked on rotaviruses, you know, for the 26 years it took us to make the vaccine. That virus had been worked on for four decades before I started working on it, both in animals and then ultimately people. And then there was a vaccine introduced in the late 1990s that caused in its inception, you know, intestinal blockage, which no one would have predicted. And we'd been working on that vaccine in either animals or people for 40 years. And that was a surprise. Here, we've been on it for about a year. So I think you have to be humble here. In terms of, of explaining to people, and Ruth, Ruth said this, I think, once you have the data in hand, I think then you can try and explain what you know and what you don't know. You can say you've given it, say, to 20,000 people safely, but that's not 20 million people. But there are systems in place like the Vaccine Safety Data Link or the PRISM system program by the, uh, the FDA, you know, that, that can then look for rare adverse events. And as Ruth said, you know, you, you know that a vaccine is effective for a certain length of time, but you don't know how long. And you will know that over time. Um, so you have to be really Really honest and transparent about what you know and what you don't know. And I think if we do that, it's going to be, I think, a, a slow climb up the hill, but I think we can get there. Yeah. Mike, do we think, um, are we going to have an annual coronavirus vaccine? Do I need to prepare my children for a flu shot and a COVID-19 shot? I don't know that. Uh, there's been monitoring of the viruses. We've seen a new plate emerge different from uh, what emerged in, in China, and that'll be one of the, uh, the things to watch. As uh, uh, Paul mentioned earlier, this is an unusual virus, an envelope coronavirus that does not exhibit striking seasonality. This virus did not read the book. That's always uh, bothersome. I would just add, if I may, a bit of a comment to the, the, the last uh, discussion, and that is, with all our attempts uh, to be open, uh, two points. One, there is uh, a proportion of the population, they've already in polls said they won't take the vaccine. They're subdivided into one group that is fanatically, uh, conceptually anti-vaccine. They will not be, um, their minds I do not think will be changed based on uh, interactions over measles uh, vaccination in past years. And then there are others who are hesitant. They see, they see smoke. They wonder if there's a fire there. But the truth is, um, even with well done trials, uh, and we do everything right, um, we follow up, there are unexpected things that happen. And we need to look back in the other dress rehearsals. In 76, about 40 million Americans were immunized and rarely, it was very rare event, but uh, ascending paralysis, Guillain-Barre. What a, a terrible uh, uh, legacy, but it's part of our, our legacy. Um, we, we just need to be very, very uh, careful. Um, we need to be as open as possible. We also need to recognize that there are folks out there who are planning to do their own uh, uh, education of, of, of the, the, the population. I really like uh, uh, Paul's uh, comment about humility uh, in vaccine development. Well, one thing missing is a, a, a soothsayer, and not someone to look into the future, something we can't do. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, that's, that probably says a lot, which is the uncertainty that we're dealing with right now. Why don't we turn it over to some questions that are coming in? 
uh, from the audience. And um, someone was interested in Will's um, a proposal for how we lead, uh, you know, future development efforts toward pandemics. Um, so interested in your perspective and critique of the BARDA-led approach um, and what you have posed, which are pooled rewards and incentives. Um, the question is, is there a key difference um, with the patent structure? Is it possible to think about investments of sufficient size by governments, the ultimate prices that are paid? Um, through the kind of arrangements that are closer to marginal costs. So I think essentially what your paper outlined, um, how do we really move forward? And how do you think about this current approach in terms of how BARDA has really invested significantly in clinical development, also manufacturing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, it, it's interesting and you'll have to pardon me if I veer too much towards the legal because that's my background. Um, but I think whereas the, the constitution uh, suggested the patent system, in fact, not even suggested, uh, delineated it, and that this created this monopoly issue. The Constitution also provided a potential solution. I remember back in the days when people were complaining about the price of HIV and AIDS medication and the fact that these were patent protected drugs and that they should just be given to patients. Well, there is a solution within the Constitution. It's a taking. And that essentially you pay fair market value for this piece, uh, this asset, this piece of property held by a private party. And in exchange, you now own it and can genericize it. And rather than do it ex, ex post, we're doing it ex ante, saying, look, this is the pooled reward. You play in the system. And in exchange, the public essentially gets to own the intellectual property such that we can produce it at marginal cost. This is basically like Hatch Waxman, but after the fifth, sixth, seventh entrant, not the 180 day exclusivity. So it's, it's a merger of some of those concepts that essentially what we would be saying, and this isn't without gain to the pharma company either, uh, because you know, in infectious disease, in H1N1, for example, as Dr. Nabel and my father were, were very happy to point out to me, you know, people had ramped up and made enormous investments only for the market never to materialize after the fact. They took enormous risk and they got nothing for it. Here you would know ahead of time that there is a locked in benefit that has to be of sufficient size to incentivize you anyway, and that that is going to be your reward. In exchange, the public reward is pricing as close to marginal cost or distribution cost plus marginal cost as possible. And so I think these are the concepts that we're playing with. I saw somebody else had a question saying like, are these types of efforts underway? They've, they've been suggested, um, but nobody has actually um, undertaken to build this reward system, not transnationally uh, and certainly not in the United States. But I think it would be a tremendous legacy of the COVID-19 pandemic to have the infrastructure for such a system for specifically delineated diseases, those where the social positive externality is such that they're called for. Yeah. And maybe to continue down that, that line of thought, um, Gary, a question came in um, in the chat in terms of, is it possible to realize viable global partnership in this currently highly competitive, uh, fragmented international environment? And what would be effective next steps to take us closer to that direction? where we're not nationalizing vaccine development, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say, uh, despite, you know, a lot of the heat that we see, in, at least in the media, I, I do think that collaboration does happen across borders. I think that, um, you know, a good example, I, I, I cite this only because it, it involves the company that I work with, but you know, Sanofi uh, basically partnered with GSK, two different companies in two different countries uh, on a COVID vaccine where Sanofi is using the protein-based uh, technology that uh, is, uh, relies on um, baculovirus insect production together with an adjuvant that GSK use, used and, and actually had an agreement with BARDA for emergency use, um, that had the net effect of saying, well, he, here's an opportunity both to enhance the uh, potency of the protein-based vaccine and potentially also reduce the dose that you would have to give to any individual. So you'd have more supply, uh, 
and potentially more effective. Now that needs to be demonstrated, but I think what the example uh, shows is when there are aligned incentives and where both parties can stand to gain and do things together that they couldn't do alone, then I think those kinds of partnerships can happen. And I, I think there have been fits and starts. I think we need to do better. And if, if I were to suggest something new to try to address, you know, this kind of um, uh, a disconnect that we experienced with the, the current COVID outbreak, I, I would say that we need to have uh, essentially you know, the equivalent of a biological UN. We, we need to say, listen, we are going to unite uh, and coordinate. We're going to forget politics. We're going to focus on the science, on the epidemiology, on the virology, on the vaccinology, and we're going to do what's in the best interest for everybody on the planet. I think that can be done. I think you, you need to have some investment there. And we'll mention before the G8, the G20, Given the economic impact that this uh, 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 epidemic has created, you know, investing a few billion dollars a year compared to the trillions of dollars that this took out of the world's economy would be a small price to pay. And so I think we need to think about new structures. I think we need to th think about new funding mechanisms. Uh, I think we also need to recognize, and this is maybe something that hasn't been said, but should really be top of mind here. Um, it, it hasn't, in our lifetime, it hasn't just been COVID. Think back to HIV. HIV was not a, a, a problem when I was a kid. There was no such thing as HIV. Now over, thir you know, over 38 million people have died of HIV. We've had avian flu, we've had SARS, we've had chikungunya, we've had Ebola. It, it, they, they come one after another. We, th this will not be our last show. There will be more. And so I, I do think that the, the time is now. And, and I do think not only can we do better, we must do better and we need to be thinking globally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ruth, um, a question came in with regard to there's been a loss of trust in government over the last 40 years, um, which of course doesn't bode well for public health um, immunization efforts. And how, you talked a little bit about this earlier, how can we communicate the benefits and the risk to a very skeptical public um, and then the second part of that question deals with, well, what does this mean for pediatric patients and adult patients in terms of building that trust? Um, will parents feel comfortable vaccinating their young children who potentially have not participated in these clinical trials? Right. Um, so, so I think, so thank you for that question. Um, thank the audience members. And I think there are really um, several parts to that. So. I would a little bit take issue with the notion of a very skeptical public. I would go back to something that Mike said. So, and, and I think some, certainly something that Paul has talked about quite a bit, which is that the number of people who really are, um, are anti-vaxxers, if you will, is a small but very vocal minority. And there are a much larger number of people who in fact are vaccine hesitant and who can be brought along. And I think the way to do it, as I think we've really talked about before, um, is, is really to be transparent, to be absolutely clear about what it is that we know what it is that we don't know, why we're advocating vaccination, what the risks are, what the benefits are. And I think we, and I think we need to think about that population by population. And I think that the conclusions we come to for, it, for elderly adults, for younger adults, for pregnant women, for children, that we, we will weigh all of those things. 
Um, what I do think is true is that we um, will probably not recommend vaccination before we have some data from clinical trials in various populations. We will not recommend widespread vaccination. And so there are people thinking about how we can do those studies um, in those various populations. And certainly, um, you know, people have been talking, for example, quite a bit about about pregnant women and, and when and how those studies will come. So I think we need to generate data. It will not be the kind of 30,000 person data that we have from our, from our big efficacy trials, but we need to have some of that information. And then I think we need to communicate. I imagine that some of my colleagues might want to weigh in on this as well. Well, I'm actually going to go in a different direction, but I think that that was, you know, very well stated and, and in fact, a bit reassuring um, as well. Maybe to close out with this Q&A, we've talked a lot about what gives us pause, maybe some things that are concerning, um, some reassurances. But as you think about where we are right now, what gives you hope? Um, where, where is your greatest optimism coming from, despite uh, the very challenging news that we see every day. Mark, why don't we start with you? What gives you hope? Well, I, I think we are on a path for an effective vaccine. And that is something that is in the end gonna help us get out of and beyond this pandemic and turn it into a more manageable uh, ongoing public health threat at, at worst, uh, more, more like the flu. Um, hopefully things will end up better. Um, you know, I, I think we've also had some opportunities to learn about ways to work together more effectively um, outside of the research context. Uh, there's some new steps of public health agencies working with healthcare organizations to um, get out in communities using community health workers to help identify high risk individuals to do testing more effectively. Uh, I hope we can build on that. In the area of research, there have been very important collaborations. You know, we still have a ways to go. If you look at most of the clinical trials that have been undertaken for COVID, they're unfortunately not gonna yield um, any meaningful results because they weren't designed with enough power uh, to begin with or because the, um, uh, pandemic petered out uh, in the specific location where they were being tested. But we've seen with the, the vaccine trials, with what um, uh, uh, other uh, trial networks are trying to do, both uh, active led by the NIH support and some uh, private efforts like uh, I Spy COVID that are trying to do very fast trials, much more efficiently with more limited data collection. We can do a lot better at this, and you've already heard from others about uh, collaborations on um, uh, on uh, developing distribution capacity, planning so that we don't uh, aren't aren't just uh, relying on very thin and fragile uh, supply systems. Uh, and the point about planning ahead for creating the right incentives for for new technologies, you know, we may not do it in the context of COVID vaccines this time around, but there's added support for doing market entry rewards and the like for um, antibiotics that can be used against resistant or organisms and other uh, public health threats with global collaborative support. So I hope we can make the most of the, the silver lining here. It's been an incredibly burdensome pandemic, particularly here in the United States, but uh, I do see some uh, good uh, steps coming out, not the least of which is getting effective vaccines for, for COVID. Right. Well, in, in 30 seconds for, for everyone, I'll, I'll go down the line just to close this out. What gives you hope, Paul? I mean, um, scientific advances have allowed us to live 30 years longer than we did 100 years ago. I think science is our way out of this. I think that the dual prong of hygienic measures and a vaccine will enable us to climb out of this. I think it's going to be a, a slower climb than maybe some would like. I don't think vaccines are going to be a magic bullet, but I think along with hygienic measures, we will be able to, to climb out of this. Great. Mike? Uh, vaccine is the tool we need. This discussion brings me back to uh, the days when polio in the 40s and 50s was the scourge and there was no NIH um, grants and uh, the National Foundation uh, uh, for Infantile Paralysis where people as a kid would go around with a little thing to collect money. The people paid for a vaccine that was tested in a 
a massive, the famous Tommy Francis field trial and showing efficacy and there was celebration and that was everybody's vaccine. It harkens back to a time when uh, a different era when everybody pulled together and it was everybody's vaccine. We're gonna have vaccines, they're gonna work and we're gonna stop this uh, uh, COVID. Great, Ruth? Yeah, so I would say the willingness of everyone to roll up their sleeves and I, I mean that um, figuratively with respect to vaccine developers, the government, clinical investigators, um, to get trials up and going, and of course participants who are willing to come and, and do this, and, and, and really everybody committed to the greater good. I also have to say as a pediatrician in a school of public health, um, the new respect for public health that I think has, has um, not been present, but I think um, people appreciate the importance and, and I hope that will, be, um, that will continue going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Will, and then Gary, you get the last word. Will? Yeah, I mean, this is essentially echoing what, what everybody else said, but the, the ability, particularly in the private sector, to respect the public interest and collaborate and coordinate in ways that we hadn't seen before. Everything from the GSK and Sanofi collaboration to that letter that was written by Pfizer and J&J &J and Moderna. I mean, these are things that cut against private interests in the name of public health. And I think that's a positive outcome to uh, what we've been seeing in the last six months or so. Gary. Well, I, I'll put it simply. I think uh, for me, I, the, the hope is that there is an end in sight. I think the end is months away, uh, not, not decades away, m months and may possibly a year or so. Uh, it'll be a little bit longer before we get back to normal, but there is an end. And the way we're going to get there is through science. Uh, I think that um, you, we're going to see... Uh, the contribution from diagnostics, from therapies, and from vaccines. And we will get there. I think we all have to pull together. We all have to support one another. And the final thing I'd say is just that we should also be very appreciative of uh, the, our doctors on the front lines and our, our health professionals. They have been through an amazing experience. Uh, we, we only hear a fraction of the stories, but to the people on the ground, um, when it's all over, we owe them a lot. And I think part of what we owe them too is to build systems in the future that prevent this from ever happening again. Yeah. Well, what a fantastic way to end. Thank you all so much. This was a tremendous conversation. Um, you know, incredibly thoughtful, very needed, I think, to provide clarity uh, to all of us who are watching this very closely, but to families who are looking uh, for a ray of hope. Um, thank you for all of your efforts in lending us your expertise today. Uh, give it back to Donna. Wonderful. And let me please add my thanks for what an amazing discussion. It truly was outstanding. So thank you so very much. Before our short break, I just want to encourage everyone to visit the booths in the virtual lobby for all of the 21 uh, 21 vo 20 voices, three minutes, one question segments, and of course, all sorts of other wonderful resources. Now, as this session closes out, please return to the lobby to join our next session in the auditorium. And if by any chance you close out of the lobby tab, simply just log back into the forum using your using initial login page. So we'll be back for our next panel, which is the science of vaccine confidence at 3.30 Eastern time. Thank you so much and we will see you soon.